Thanks, guys. Okay. And then we're gonna let Paul start us off in a minute or so. We still have a minute or two. A minute. Oh, we're there. It's one o'clock. So okay. want to just go ahead and start. Here we are at Sacred Music Class, and today we're talking about the Greek culture. We have a special guest with us, along with Professor Carol. We have uh, Dr. Jean Ryu. Yeah, so we're going to talk about sacred music and the Greek culture in specific. So, Professor Carol? Yes. I'm here, and I'm. thank you, Paul, again for being here to start all of this off. And I'm so glad that John Ryu could be here with us. Dr. Ryu is uh, his whole family. I've been very blessed to come to know and learn a great deal from. And it's very nice of you to take the time. I know you're used to online teaching, but it's still very, very nice of you to take the time to join us today. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, Glad well, we appreciate you kind of getting volunteered for this. Um, <laughs> but, you know, not a lot of us know a lot of people who know a great deal about ancient Greek culture. That's just not that common, and there you are, that is your field. Can I ask you right off the bat how you got interested in your field? You're professor of philosophy at Benedictine. You teach all kinds of aspects of philosophy, uh, as I understand, but you had to get interested in that somewhere along the line. How did that happen? Well, I went, it was really my, my undergraduate education. I went to a small school in California that's a great book school, and what they did is they started off freshman year with ancient literature, ancient theology, ancient philosophy, ancient science. In other words, they, they took you through the four years of your college education, beginning with the very earliest writings. So my first exposure to philosophy was Aristotle, Plato, uh, and some of the lesser-known philosophers in that period, and I just fell in love with them. Plus, I saw that a lot of the um, philosophical thought of the Middle Ages, and that became my focus, was based upon uh, Greek philosophy. So there's a nice connection there between you know the Greeks and the Middle Ages, and then after that it gets it gets pretty dicey. It goes off in all directions, but that's that. So it was really college. College did it. When you say great book school, just because I know a lot of people who are involved in our courses are parents of high schoolers, and sure. what does that mean by a great book school? Well, you um, rather than reading a textbook written by an expert on a particular subject. Uh, a living person. What what the Great Books approach uh, tries to do is to say, okay, this expert had to finally go back, let's say take Plato for instance, had to go back and read Plato uh, very carefully to come up with his views as to what Plato thought. So it's sort of the pro it's, it's the same process as cutting out the middleman in business. <laughs> right? So what you do is you actually go to the source and you say, okay, rather than talk about what this particular expert or that expert thinks about Plato, and of course the experts disagree, let's go to Plato himself. There's a wonderful introduction that C.S. Lewis wrote. Uh, there's a work by Athanasius called On the Incarnation, and Lewis wrote an introduction to it in which he talks about the great books, and he says far better to go to the original sources themselves right, than just to read a textbook that someone has written about, about uh, whomever or whatever. So that's great books education. You go right to the source for whatever. Uh, whatever area of study. And, and I would so, guess for instance, for, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was going to say, for an 18-year-old, that's a real awakening, I would think. Oh, my gosh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, having gone through, for example, mathematics, uh, in high school math, you look at a textbook, and you get all your definitions at the beginning, and then you get all the axioms, and then you demonstrate conclusions, and it's all very nice and neat, and then you look at what mathematicians had to do to actually come up with math. And it's remarkable. It's remarkable to see all the all the all the uh, work they had to do to get through to that. And I think it provides you with a better understanding of what's going on. We read the De Musica, for example, of uh, Boethius in my junior year. So Boethius' seminal work on music, uh, rather than no offense, <laughs> Professor Carroll, but rather than read an expert's opinion on music theory, we went back to to Boethius and actually read this. Uh, and it was helpful too because we were doing Latin at the same time. So it was great. This is a nice mix. Yeah. You mentioned going to the source. Is it? Would you advise uh, doing that for a junior high or high school student, or or is there something that would be a good stepping stone, something to yeah. get them interested at first? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so a lot of these things. There, there are works I read in college 
which I did not do justice to because I was too young then. And I can go back to them now and get a lot more out of them. So, you know, even even where I went, they they used a Latin textbook to teach us Latin. Um, so I would say, you know, start with some of the more accessible works. Plato, if you want to study philosophy, Plato's an excellent place to begin it for a young person. Uh, high school, even even junior high, um, uh, he has he's very accessible. He has some interesting discussions, raises interesting questions. It's not clear to me that you could do science using great books in high school. That would be very tough because there's a lot of math behind those things, and you have to have that level of math. Uh, at your fingertips, but yeah, I think I think there's a there's a good range there, but um, some of the works are more accessible than others, uh, mm -hmm. so that's what I would encourage younger people to do. Well, we were so grateful that you would come on because in our um, in our third unit of uh, early sacred music, we're we're doing our best to bring to life some of the aspects of Greek culture it, that the early Christians encountered in those mm -hmm. first centuries and so how the influence of that high level of culture uh, in Roman society affected Christian thought. I mean, that's a huge topic, I know, but uh, yeah. that's partly what you teach. Is that correct? Um, well, yeah. It's, my area is philosophy, so I'm, I'm, I'm much more focused on philosophical thought, but some of it, of course, is bound up with the culture of the Greeks and the Romans. You know, how, how they lived out their lives is a very important part of how they thought philosophically about the world that they lived in. So... That's, that's uh, I teach, I teach, for a great example, since we're talking about music, is, um, is the Greeks, their conception of music was very, very uh, mathematical. Um, they were far, far more interested in the math behind musical intervals than in uh, the pleasing sounds that those intervals would bring about, right? So we think of music today as a fine art. They thought of it much more as applied math, applied arithmetic specifically. So you could take, you know, numerical ratios and you can hear them, <laughs> right, in musical intervals, uh, and that fascinated them. So the, the whole notion of Greek music was very much a study of mathematics as applied to sounds, uh, and that that's what they were first and foremost interested in. So yeah, definite connections. Now, when you get to um, to Christ, early Christian culture. Um, yeah, they weren't at all initially very inclined to accept what the pagans had come up with. <laughs> you know, after all, the pagans were um, their persecutors, right, in the early Christian church. So they were a little leery of that. But after a while, they said, hey, listen, you know, the truths that they've come up with are, are still quite valuable and useful, and we can understand God through those things. So that was that was part of that transition there. I don't know if I addressed your question. Professor. Yes. No. Well, look, can we talk about that? Uh, which, what? I, I often hear. I'm sorry. I'll find a coherent sentence here in a minute. But I often hear people say, "Oh, you know, you, you don't have to read all of that Greek philosophy. But you should read Aristotle. It's very helpful in understanding early Christianity." And so, what? I mean, what? What truths did appeal to the early Christian communities? Yeah, well, first of all, they were just concerned with staying alive early, right? So it was, you know, before the Edict of Milan. There's you know, persecution, you know, they, they don't have time to sit down and say, okay, well, how should we educate our children? Or, you know, should it just be training in the truths of the faith? Or is there a broader uh, way to study, to study things beyond just religious truth? And I think that's where the, the, the ancient Greeks and Romans came in. And so, you know, the Romans especially were uh, primarily Stoics, and there's a whole culture or current of philosophy among the Stoics, that's how they actually live their lives, is, is through Stoic philosophy. So philosophy for them was what religion was for the early Christians, a pattern of life. Right? But there were tensions between the Stoics and the Christians. They had to work out the different views. Uh, you know, is there immortality, for example, of the soul? That's a huge question for the Romans. Christians had sort of a very good answer already to hand. So they tended to resist Roman philosophy because it was, you know, grappling with this thing. And, and in a lot of cases, they just simply out and out denied it. And then they say, well, what can we bring in from Roman philosophy that's valuable? So it's a later development. You know, it's not going to be, it's going to be Augustine, you know, uh, um, certainly Boethius, uh, the Christians uh, um, start talking about connections that they might have with those early Greek thinkers. 
But as I said, their first concern was, <laughs> how can we avoid that that lion, you know, sitting over there in the corner? So, yeah. So what you know, if you're thinking what specific issues, I would say it's the big questions, right? Immortality, the existence of God, what role God has in our lives. Those were huge questions for the Christians early on, and a lot of the pagans didn't help. <laughs> Some of them were atheists, right? So it was it was quite a grappling, a grappling. Justin Martyr is a great example, I think, of of an early Christian thinker who finally started saying, listen, there's something that we can get from these people that's valuable. Um, yeah. Well, what do you think it was referring to? What do you think Paul was referring to when he was saying to beware of philosophy? Yeah. yeah. Well, Paul, Paul is very cautious um, because, as I said, Roman views and Greek views, they held things which are incompatible with the Christianity that Paul was, was preaching. Um, but I think really it's interesting. If you you know when when people think of Greek philosophy in particular today, they think of Aristotle and they think of Plato. Those are the big ones. But in their day, Plato and Aristotle were were relatively unknown. Um, there were very small schools uh, uh, in Athens where Aristotle and Plato would teach, and there'd be a small group of individuals who were affected by that teaching. But for the most part, people were, as I said, Stoics. That was a very very common philosophical view. Uh, arising from some of the early Stoic philosophers, or Epicureanism. That was, you know, Epicurus was a, a materialist. He, he thought everything in the universe is just matter. Uh, there really is no immortal soul. There are no gods that we have to concern ourselves about. So you can imagine Paul hearing what most Romans think and saying, don't have anything to do with those people, right? And then later, the teachings of Aristotle and Plato came along with Augustine and then later Thomas Aquinas. And they said, well, wait a minute, this is not your typical Greek philosophy. So I think that's what Paul had in mind, is the Stoics and the Epicureans. Um, so he wasn't opposed to philosophy as such, right? I think he was opposed to those dangerous um, currents of thought that most people live by in, in Roman society. Seems to me that, that was the concern. Since you mentioned Stoics, uh, and, and of course we use that phrase a lot in conversation, sure. but not everybody's had an opportunity to look at what that word really means. And could you say a little more about that, sure. please? Sure. Stoics, what characterizes a Stoic is um, they want to live in, in uh, harmony with nature. So there would be a lot of people today who would be attracted to Stoicism because they say nature sets the pattern for human life. So a Stoic would say, listen, there are certain things you can control in your life. There are other things you can't control in your life. Don't worry about the things you can't control. Only concern yourself with the things that you can. Right? So if you've ever heard the phrase, I think it's sometimes ascribed to Francis where he says, or, or it's a saying ascribed to Francis where he says, you know, Lord, help me to be able to discern the things that I can control from the things that I can't control. Right? So that I can, you know, uh, especially the wisdom to know the difference, right? That's the particular point. Well, that notion, you can find it in uh, Stoic uh, thought. Yeah, let me discern the difference between the things that I can control or I can't. Of course, they went to extremes. I mean, a typical Stoic claim would be, do not um, uh, love those whom you love unduly. Don't, don't put too much uh, uh, of your life into those whom you love. Because you have to remember they're mortals and they might perish. And you don't want your peace of mind to be um, uh, altered by the fact that someone you love has died. So as far as attachment to things, you know, when we speak of someone as being a Stoic, they're sort of cold and unemotional, that's definitely a Stoic view, right? So if I'm too closely attached to something, if I lose it, then I feel bad. I'm unhappy. So their solution was don't get too attached to things, including those you love. Right? So think of your wife as a mortal, says Epictetus, who's a, one of the prominent sto Stoics. He says, whenever you look at your wife, remember, this person is a mortal. That way, if she dies, you won't be too upset by it. <laughs> That's Stoicism. I'm not kidding. Yeah. So the Romans, you're right, think of Roman society, very, very strong. Or the Spartans, right? The ancient Greek Spartans, very, very um, wary of emotional attachment. We find it astonishing today, but that's a Stoic view. Yeah. On the other hand, right, it is kind of reasonable to say, should I concern myself with things that I have no control over? 
well, finally not, right? If you really don't have any control over them, then it doesn't make sense to get too upset by them. And so you have a nice Christian connection there where Christ says, you know, don't worry about things. You know, the birds of the air, uh, they have what they need. Their father gives them what they need. And Stoic philosophers came along and they said, that's us. Do you see? So you start having connections between uh, the pagan thought and Christian thought. And Christians, of course, making uh, much of those connections and trying to lead pagans to Christianity by saying, hey, we're saying much the same as you're saying in some cases. Yeah, that's Stoicism. Epicureanism, the other view, is um, uh, that's a very common view today, right? Uh, the only thing that's good in life is pleasure. Um, uh, we're just animals. We're just physical beings. Uh, our soul is just... You know, the, the way our matter, our body is put together, when we die, there's nothing left. Uh, so carpe diem, if you're familiar with that phrase, that's Epicureanism. So the average uh, high school, I mean college student, <laughs> is fully familiar, right? They say YOLO today instead of carpe diem. So it's, you only live once, and then they just live life to the fullest. And uh, that would be an Epicurean view. So the views are still out there, and still um, people still hold them. They just don't call them that. Uh, yeah. So that's why I think it's important to study Greek philosophy. Yeah. Wow. That's a great endorsement, too. I mean, you know, th I do think it helps. This is sort of the premise of a college education is that it helps us figure out what it is we think and why we think it to give mm -hmm. us at least an edge and understanding so we're not victims of our own yeah. sort of mindless thought. You know, that's yeah. at least a yeah. theory. Yeah. We're born, in, we're born with certain intellectual thoughts, or at least our young, our, in, in our youth, right? We uncritically just drink everything in that we're told, and studying the Greeks helps you to say, now wait a minute, which, which of those things do I really want to hold on to? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at Paul because I, I, I see his face. I'm thinking there's questions that he wants to ask, and I talk so much, as everybody knows. <laughs> I'm going to try to be quiet for a minute. Oh, no, I'm just enjoying it. You know, I... Professor Carroll, you're the one that, that ties it into to the music, so you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm well, afraid before, if I jump in, I'll I'll take it somewhere else. But, I mean, that's okay. Well, we it's a hangout. It's a hangout. Yeah, that's I will, right. No I will problem. say, um, it it is, um, you know, as you start to study, you realize that, you know, especially the New Testament was written in a time where all of these cultures were were colliding or, you know, coexisting where you had the Hebrew culture and you had the Greek culture together mm -hmm. and then you know even some others but it is interesting too when you when you read the oh the parables and the sermon on the mount and just the teachings of Jesus and then going into Paul as well to be able to discern which ones come from Hebrew thought which ones come from Greek thought and then which ones even complement each other or coincide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I think for a lot of people, take, take the Ten Commandments, for example. A lot of people follow those because they are, uh, you know, in terms of their own religious belief, these are things that God told us not to do. But other people have come up with the same list or more or less at least some of the same principles independently of any kind of religious view. So what you're saying is, why do I hold these things? Well, maybe it's possible that you hold them because, on the one hand, they are part of your religious belief, and on the other, they make sense too, <laughs> right? It, it really adds support to our thought to see those connections. Like you said, does it come from the Hebrews? Does it come from the Greeks? Um, well, it might make a difference to a particular person, but the two are not incompatible, right, in terms of the origin of the, of the view. Um, so I think it, it can serve to strengthen. Now, of course, there are incompatibilities between between pagan thought and them. Um, there's there's a great passage. This is Thomas Aquinas. He's in medieval, but um, there's a great passage. He says when um, when the Israelites were told they could finally leave Egypt, right? They were told that they could take this, some of the spoils of Egypt with them as they left as they left uh, Egypt and, and imprisonment and uh, slavery. And Thomas Aquinas says, you know, that's a little bit like taking what's good from pagan culture and teaching and in Christianity. You're sort of taking the spoils 
right, of the pagan cultures and using them for purposes of, of mm -hmm. uh, the Christian faith, which is a nice, nice analogy. Oh, that is. I just took a note on that. I'm gonna, <laughs> you're going to have to tell me exactly where to find Oh, for Aquinas? If I were to... Yeah, you'll, I know I'll be... If I move it, maybe add in another thought. We're not talking specifically about music, but we're talking about culture. I always sure. wonder how you move to society from such extreme, sophisticated, artistically developed polytheism in Greek culture to monotheism. I mean, that we don't spend too much time thinking about that, although we live in a modern world where we are more polytheistic, I think, uh, than people realize. But tell mm -hmm. us, can you talk to us about just what that involved, how big a deal that was? Well, you know, you know some, sometimes what I have to do in my classes is, is say, there's what you've been taught, and then there's what you see when you actually go back to these sources and read them. And the prime example is, you know, everyone in the Middle Ages thought that the world was flat, which is, you know, that, that's nonsense. And when you go back and you read the medieval um, uh, thinkers, no one thought that. Right? No one thought that. I mean, so there, there are some things, I think, that are um, sort of broad brush, right, treatments of what the of ancient thought. There were monotheists among, among the ancients. Right, so we know uh, uh, Akhenaten, for example, among the Egyptians, uh, very strong tendency toward a single god. Right, so the sun god became the one god, uh, and he really was—I mean, it, it was quite um, dangerous for him because he was pushing on this so hard. Uh, Plato and Aristotle, to give other examples, if you go back and read them, it's very clear for both of them uh, that there's a single god. Now, as I said, they were not so influential in their day. So your question is still a very good question, right? How do you go from multiple gods, gods for every, everything that occurs in your life, right? There's a, there's a god for hanging out the laundry, right? There's a god for whatever it happens to be. Um, how do you go from that to a single god? Um, well, I think, I think the only way you could, you could lead people to see that is through a teaching of some sort, you know, to say how... how, <laughs> how take their own fables, and you say, gosh, wouldn't the world be a huge mess if those fables were really true that way, if the gods were always fighting among themselves and um, disagreeing and there was no common right, common view, and then you say, well, given that there's, there seems to be something tying everything together, doesn't it make sense that there would be a single god? And I think that's the way it would have to go. Culturally, Professor Carroll, culturally, I honestly don't know how that works. You know, some people will say, is it culture that precedes thought, philosophical thought, or is it philosophical thought that precedes the culture? And, um, you know, I do think thoughts have consequences, but how you get that into the culture, I really don't know. I honestly don't know. I know the Romans were most upset with the Christians, not for having a different God, but for denying, for, for maintaining that there was only one. That was the biggest problem for them. Um, you know, it's it's sort of it was politically incorrect to it was fine to say God is Jehovah. It was politically incorrect to say, but your God is not a God. <laughs> that was that was the, that's what got them killed, I think. Um, so how you bring that into a culture? That's that's a tough one. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, no, that's that's yeah. great because. You know, I just think about all of those temples. You know? Yeah, sure. All of the musicians and priests and all the protocol and yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you how do you stand up as an early Christian? Well, you you paid the price, of course, and yeah. say this doesn't this is not important. This is all made up. I mean, that's just right. radical. Right. Oh sure. Oh sure. Yeah. They didn't. They and they didn't like it. <laughs> the Romans did not like it. So. Yeah. Isn't that in part what? Uh, Constantine did. Many people assert that that he was able to to do that. Uh, some, as I understand it, some of the right. you know iconography and things like that were mm -hmm. were sort of switched or you know I don't know blended in a way that sort of made it a little easier for that culture to accept. Okay, there's one God, and then yep. these are his saints. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what you guys have been talking about, maybe are angels or saints or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And even Paul, right? St. Paul does that because he he goes into Athens and he says, you know, you have a monument to an unknown god. 
my God is that God that you have this monument to. And it was a perfect rhetorical uh, tool for him to use because they already acknowledged that there were gods they didn't know. And Paul says, hey, here he is, right? And so why don't you come to know him, <laughs> right? So it was a, a delicious um, rhetorical move that Paul made right there. Yes. Uh, but I know Constantine, yeah, he, he, but he brought, finally brought everything under Christianity and how he did that. You know, the, the incorporation of feasts, you know, um, uh, so, you know, in, in the solstice, I mean, um, uh, the vernal equinox, right, you'd say, well, what are we going to do? Well, let's do something around this time, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, how about Easter? <laughs> you know, and you say, well, they already had a feast around that time. Let's actually have the Christian feast at the same time and then they will be inclined to combine the two. You know, that, that sort of thing, I think, is how it happens culturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the paradigm for that that I am uh, versed in is the going up a couple of uh, millennia, I guess you'd have to oh, say, okay. but is in the Soviet overtaking of Christianity in Russia using, you know, literally in our Russian Orthodox class, we're about to talk about that today in, t in today's material, uh, unit yes. two, everybody. But you know how you <laughs> take exactly the symbols of Orthodoxy and the and the Theotokos, the mother, you know, the Virgin Mary with child, and you you put a little baby in Stalin's hand, you know, yeah, and I mean all of this was yeah. you take the colors red from the church and the, I mean it's yeah. it just as if a committee sat down and said, okay, these are the good yeah. things that we know will work, let's just yeah. tweak them. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. Happened. No, I, agree. I agree, I agree. Even the swastika apparently for the Germans, the swastika was a, was a, was a, was a form of the cross. Mm -hmm. It was a Christian symbol, it was an Indian symbol. I mean religious, religious Peoples around the world for centuries were using that symbol, yeah. um, and then it was sort of stolen, <laughs> right? Appropriated by by the fascists um, to symbolize something very very terrible. So much so that we can't we can't use the symbol anymore. I mean, it means only one thing for us because of history. So yeah, culture culture is a tough is a tough battle. I, I'm much more uh, familiar with and comfortable with right the realm of ideas, and and I do think I do think. You know, the way people come to conclusions mentally has an effect on culture as well. Um, you know, the, the whole, it's not, I don't think it's an accident that both art and music or the fine arts generally, there was a lot of order in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, almost a kind of, in music it would be harmony, you know, and then, and then that, that kind of structure, if I can put it that way, you'll correct me, Professor Carroll, I'm sure, if I'm getting this wrong, but there was a lot of structure there, which the Greeks would say is a natural structure for music and art, and then those, those structures were lost, and they were lost historically in Europe at around the same time, and I can't help but think that the philosophy of the day affected that as well, right? So it's as if everything fell apart. The structures were gone, right? You didn't have harmony in music. Uh, you had atonality, intentional atonality. Um, you didn't have uh, realism in, in 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 sculpture or painting. You had intentional fracturing, right, of of, of um, obvious things of of, of uh, recognizable forms. I think they go hand in hand. Yeah. I and mean, Plato has this really neat observation. He says he was he was against flute playing. Plato. He says you can't play the flute; it's too exciting. So that, <laughs> there it is. I don't well, know what effect he had, but that's always so interesting. It's it's dense to read. It's hard. You can't get it down to a paragraph or three pages. And I think when uh -huh. you study musicology or music history on a graduate level, when you always take these survey courses about musical thought, and you get this uh -huh. anthology, and they're marvelous anthologies with very good translations and good notes, and you read two or three pages. And you mm -hmm. just shake your head, and, and you don't have a way to, to to fit that with your knowledge of Brahms and Bach and Beethoven. But right. boy, those guys were specific on modes. I, yeah. I'm always amazed what Plato would write. You know, before our men go off to war, they yeah. should not yeah. hear something in this key because yeah, that's right. this key will sap their desire to be aggressive or their ability to yeah. be a properly aggressive soldier. Um, okay. That's, that's, incredible. A that's a legitimate question, isn't it? I mean, I think the one, the one everyone would would grant that see that we seem to grant even today is that minor is sad and major is not. That most people would grant that today, and that's just a very tiny portion of what the Greeks saw about the different modes of music. 
I think. Uh, I don't know. You can tell me, but that's what it seems to me. It's, you know, the Phrygian mode and all the modes that they, I don't even know what those are, but they said, yeah, some of them are exciting and some of them have this effect. Uh, they arouse the martial spirit and that sort of thing. Well, the modes being just scales. I mean, we look at them as scales today. Of course, they were based right. on mathematics, uh, sure. which we don't need, you know, the way they did because that's not what we want to hear, the music, you know. But right. you're right. I mean, that, that the mathematics behind those various sets of pitches arranged in certain patterns, which got these Greek names, Dorian and Phrygian and Mixolydian and all that, mm -hmm. off-putting, I have to say, to many musicians when they first study them because right. just like you said you're 18 you want to you want to practice for the Beethoven piano concerto you don't want to sit yes. there and figure out the modes you know but when you really get a little bit older you step back and you go this argument we have today on music and its role this is just nothing com I mean we're we're not even very sophisticated in the way we argue it and they were yeah yeah and and then there's the question of what effect it has on people which is for Plato, it was a political question. In other words, if music has an effect on people because of the mode of the music, then the state actually has to take into account what kind of music is. Can you imagine <laughs> if people started going around saying, oh, that Mixolydian mode, you just can't have any of that around anymore. <laughs> just, things would explode. I mean, you know, we'd be checking iPods and you know, making sure people aren't listening to bad modal music. <laughs> But I think that's a legitimate question. In other words, all I was trying to say is, do you think minor is sad, major is not, is natural or cultural? Well, there you go. That's, you know, it's whatever nursery rhyme songs you learn that the sad ones are in minor and the little the little the little bunny dies. You know, <laughs> and the happy ones, the flowers come up. And if you go up with that, I mean, we are Westerners. We have Western ears. You drop us down in Jakarta, and we hear. It won't work. We don't hear what a, a child from Indonesia hears, you know. That's a fact. Yeah, yeah. is that right? Yeah. So minor, minor in in India wouldn't be considered. I mean, I mean, apart from lyrics, wouldn't the music wouldn't be considered sad? Is that? You know, there's more scalar and rhythmic patterns if you get into non-Western music that, uh, you know. They don't even fit into our. Yeah. You got to hear things. You got to hear microtones. You've got to hear things in, in, in not in a linear fashion with melody because you're hearing the effect of repetitions and patterns. Uh, I find that very hard as an adult Westerner. I think you have to go, and and it's true. That's why people specialize in ethnomusicology. You know, they they just throw off their Western ears and they go immerse themselves one way or the other. It's a lot easier yeah. to do today than it used to be to be able to hear differently and time, the sense of time is very different, yeah. the music unfolds yeah. over time in a different manner. Uh, we are, I think we need to understand more that we are westernizers or westerners in our makeup and mm -hmm. it goes back to those Greeks. <laughs> right, right, right. Because they had, they, they, they would say it's in the math of things. That's what right. Plato would say. And, and math is math whether it's India or here. Yeah. <laughs> Start studying India, Indian. Uh, That's Indian exactly. What I mean. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. you find it doesn't it doesn't fit the same mathematical patterns that we use. Interesting. Interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's not. You know, I think again, what our children are. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking a lot about this right now because, of course, you guys have have big families and you've raised your babies. I'm sorry, I'm in a new grandmother role here, so you have to y'all have to forgive me. But hey, watching a child of oh, five months. I'm in a grandfather role. Yeah, I'm yeah. Well five too. months yeah, you did that recently too, and I know Paul, you haven't done that yet. Your kids are too young. It's coming, it's coming. But when you take a four or five month old baby and realize you raise this child in China, you raise this child in, in Peru, you raise this child in you know, in in um in the Polynesian part of the world, you know, that's going to be a completely different understanding of language and sound and melody and that. And, and that just, anyway, that's just on my mind a lot. Yeah, like forming yeah, a Western yeah. ear or a non-Western ear in a, in a Western thought process. And, and all that, and of course the Greeks had, but they had a lot of influences from Eastern culture. Can we, could you say something about that in terms of, because there was not an isolated Greek world. You've already made references to that. Um, yeah, I don't know much about non-Western influences on on the Greeks. Um, okay. Yeah, even I mean, there there certainly if you look at if you look at Asia Minor, even Asia Minor was really part of the Greek world, right? So what we would call um, oh, 
well, the, you know, to the on the on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea, all the way down to Turkey, let's say something like that. That was still west as far as the as far as the influences on philosophy and things like that were concerned. Um, you'd have to go pretty far west, I mean, pretty far east to get something that wouldn't fit the the western pattern there. Um, so as far as as far as philosophy goes back anyway, uh, the earliest philosophers in that era were still Western philosophers. You know, there's no. I mean, I know there's Indian philosophy, but I don't know very many influences uh, no. on the Greeks there. But um, yeah, so there's a kind of, there's a kind of isolation, I imagine, um, just geographic. Yeah. What? Where did, I should be letting Paul. Paul, you have to jump in. You have to. <laughs> I was, was going to ask uh, Dr. Riru about poetry and how we understand it as opposed to how the Greeks understood it. Right. Well, again, poetry was just an application of math. Um, so you have the long and the short. Right? So Aristotle wrote this work called The Poetics, and it's, it's a seminal work in, in um, uh, literature, Greek literature, but also the analysis of language. The, the Greek language is very different from English. I mean, we use accent to some extent, but, and you, you know, you can take the same word and pronounce it differently, and it'll mean something different, what I mean by that. But um, for the Greeks, a poem was, was much more, was very close to a song, even in the way that they would say it, because of the way the Greek language is actually pronounced. So, you know, you'd have the long and the short, and meter was extremely important for them. Um, but still, if you, you know, if, if you want, what's the philosophical thought behind poetry for them? That's not the case for us. It's that they thought, well, there are certain certain natural structures in place that you have to follow. Right. So um, remember, we talked about the notations of, of of Greek music, and they would say, well, there are these there are these things. There there are dissonant intervals. There are consonant intervals. The same would hold true for the language. Um, so it wasn't. Um, you know, we think everything goes, I think, in, in our day. So you have uh, free verse, um, open meter. Uh, you know, they're, they're yeah, we had a little frequency. I don't know if everybody saw that, because I want to ask you if you'll repeat what you just said. That like, And it may be... Okay. Would you say that again? I don't know. Did you hear that interruption, Paul? I, I, you froze up for a minute. I think Paul yeah, would be frozen. Uh, I think our, I think our, but like if you would, if you, if you were talking about, yeah, good. If you just repeat that last part, please, sir. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, you mean the natural basis? Is that the? On the free verse and the. Well, you're talking yeah. about the, the poet, you talked about the mathematics, you talked about the accents. Like right, the right. So, and, and actually when you, instead of just repeating it, because what I want to ask you about, let me add to this. Okay, let sure. me add to it, I always want to add. Is that because one of the the Plato's laws? That's one of the. I mean, I, I have not spent that much time reading Plato. Disclaimer, right. but I've tried. I've tried uh, in recent times to to become more familiar because it's it's as you say when you grow up a little bit more it gets awfully interesting. He talks so much about the poetic competition, the competitions in poetry, yeah. and is that yeah. somewhat related to what uh, the the science aspect and mathematical aspect you're talking about? Yeah, they would judge. I mean, there are two aspects. Uh, so you'd have tragedy and, and comedy, and those things they would be measured in terms of the effect that they had on the audience, like we would. So you'd say, well, you know, a tragedy, it's going to follow a certain structure. It's going to start with a person who's uh, above average, and then through circumstances beyond his or her control, some uh, terrible misfortune happens to them. That's that was like their. Um, their their structure for a tragedy and the comedy was exactly the opposite. The comedy you had a person who was um, maybe of lesser virtue or or um, less well regarded by society, and then through uh, good fortune, not through their own efforts, they're raised above to a higher level, right? Um, and that would be their comedy. And then they would say, well, look at the effect that this has. So they would judge, right? They would judge the the, the comedy and the tragedies on the basis of whether people were um, brought to in a, in a tragedy, they call it a catharsis, right? Which was a, a, a sort of, um, you know, there before they didn't know what, <laughs> go I, right? Uh, uh, Oedipus uh, is a great man, he's a, a noble man, and yet through no fault of his own, he kills his father, <coughs> excuse me, 
excuse me, he takes his mother as his wife. And then the Greeks were just horrified at this. This was a horrible crime. But since they were not the ones directly involved, but they felt, as it were, uh, sort of wrung out as a result of seeing the tragedy. It was a great tragedy because it had that, that effect. Um, so there were technical things Aristotle talks about in the poetics, you know, the meter, the rhyme, um, uh, but there are also these kind of more uh, the plot, right? The plot and the effect that it had, the spectacle, what they saw, all those things were, were part of what the Greeks would look at when they're trying to evaluate art. I guess my general point still, though, is it was highly structured compared to what I think we would say today. If you wanted to find a difference between how I would regard the fine arts among the Greeks and the fine arts in our day, it would be intentional, intentional structure. Almost, almost some people might say, you know, a, a very severe narrowing. Uh, in you know, the Baroque, <laughs> classical opened up a little bit more. Romantic opened up a little bit more, and then, whoosh! Right, there, there, there seemed to be no structure at all. Now, I, you may be right. I'm wrong on that. Right, that these people were meticulous in, in, in it was just a different kind of structure. But um, then the key for me was that the Greeks actually saw these structures as part of the nature of things. So they would say, you know, there's you know, a, a dissonant interval. There's something even wrong with it if it's unresolved. That's a, Gre that's a very strong way of the Greeks looking at things, I think. Very conservative is another way of putting it when it comes to art. Is that did that appeal to the early Christians? Do you think is that part of what was appealing? Um, that's that a good question. simple question, I guess. But yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know enough about early Christian, specifically Christian. But certainly, the medieval yeah. art of music they were very highly structured. Well, um, maybe I should say, is that something that grounds? could ground thinking today if people better understood the strength of the arguments for structure and for understanding the potential power, if you, if you allow me, for good mm -hmm. or evil, mm -hmm. of that which we do creatively, right. Um, right. which we've sort of lost in modern society. Right, right. right. It, it, you know, I think the Greeks and, and the, the Romans and even the, the medieval artists would prefer you know, even if you were to, to sculpt or paint or, or um, music doesn't apply so much in what I'm talking about because it's mostly visual arts, but if you were going to do that with respect to evil, you would want to present it in a recognizable fashion. They would look at, I think, a contemporary visual art, and they would say, you can't tell what it is. <laughs> Am I supposed to feel right about this or wrong about this? I feel wrong about it in a general way because it's not recognizably anything. Do you see what I, what, and I think that might stem a lot from, from maybe the way I look at modern art, but I think the Greek would come to the same conclusion. The ancient Greek would come to the same conclusion. If it's not an imitation of what we find in nature, then its effect is going to be um, um, fractured or uh, unspecified, something like that. So, so, yeah, so back to the point then, it, the connection for them, I think they'd say it has to be a natural connection. Um, can it be simple? Can it be beautiful? Of course, yeah. yeah the most beautiful we're, thing. You said ahead, that I'm we're sorry. beautiful because that's, to us, it's right. just say, oh, that's beautiful. Beauty was a huge thing in the thought. Could you say something It wasn't something subjective about that? for them. Said that, will you that, tell us a little more? So, so subjectivity of beauty, yeah. I, I think the, the Greeks and the Romans, and I'd say this was true in the Middle Ages as well, thought of beauty as something objective. This is sort of all the same point, isn't it? Right? So that, that um, it's not so much what you like, it's whether you, ought to, whether you should like the right thing. <laughs> should I like this? You know, if you go to someone who says, I can't stand Bach, and there's something in me that says, but you should like Bach. There's something there which I should... Um, learn to love, if, if that's a good way of putting it. And for them, this aspect, fine arts and music and all the, the music, I mean, the term music is just a general term for education, right, for, for the Greeks. It's a training. And what were they training? They were training people's emotions to respond rightly to the right things. If it's war you want, then they wanted them to feel this way. They would use this kind of music. 
Um, so yeah, to, to the right feelings was crucial for them, how you'd feel the right way. Uh, you can see that in Aristotle's ethics, right? It's not so much only doing the right thing as feeling the right way about the right things and feeling the right way about the wrong things. And that would be welcome thing to the Christians. We've gotten away from that uh, a little bit, haven't we, in today's art, Professor Carroll? Well, yeah, I mean, we were all about our individual feeling. I'm supposed to be able to encounter a piece of, you know, uh, ch uh, coconut cake and decide that it's, you know, either heaven or horrible. And, it, you know, I don't evaluate the cake. I just have to decide whether I like the cake or don't like the cake. Silly example. But um, we are completely about subjective in our modern culture. And I think it's very hard for us to imagine that our tastes were, as back at least for much of Western civilization, were meant, as you said, Professor Rue, that it has to be taught, that you have to teach and formulate just as we do in, in other habits with children. We teach them hygiene, mm -hmm. we teach them safety, we teach them nutrition, we teach them you know, posture, we teach them all these things. Generally people right. agree on that and when it comes to either if you want to call it beauty or aesthetics or, or taste in music, art and perceiving the world or whatever, we go, okay, whatever, you know, but that's kind of our culture right now. And that is antithetical to Greek thought as I understand it. That's, yeah, that's, I would say that's certainly true. That's certainly true. And if, see, uh, but we have a problem because if we're inclined to say, you know, some, some art is better than others, then it helps us find out what that standard is. The Greeks already had one. Theirs was the, the, uh, the mathematical nature of the world, right? Not what we have are people who tell us this is the best art, and they have to be right because they're the experts, <laughs> right? Right. So yes, well, of course, so and so has been studying art for sixty years, right? But that, of course, that's a problem, isn't it? Because then you're just substituting one taste for another. So. Yeah, so I, I think I think the study of the fine arts it has to grapple. The fine arts today have to grapple with this question, um, and then there's the whole matter that I raised earlier. You know, does this have real effects on people, on children, for example? Uh, and that's a very difficult matter uh, to decide. You know, uh, do you remember the study that came they came out with? Oh, this was probably 15 years ago. Uh, they were playing classical music to infants. Do you recall this, Professor Carroll? And they were saying, you know, yes, it's very good for infants to listen to Bach because then they're going to be, and Mozart, and, and I guess some of the classical and Baroque artists, because you know they're, they're going to be much more, they're going to be much more intelligent. I forget even it was a, it was a monstrous claim. It was this huge claim that they were making. Yeah. But I think people are searching that. What kind of things should we be listening to? What kinds of things should we be looking at and studying? Um, it's a tough question to answer. Paul, I'm giving you an opening. Oh well, <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, you guys, I'm, I'm so ingrained in pop culture that I just, that's, that's my problem. Is I, I just refer back to anything that's pop culture, and it's, it's not even art. But, I mean, there, that I, I was just reading this morning where a, a musical artist walked out of the latest Grammy Awards show. Because just just offended at what they were putting up there is this yeah. is the top this is yeah. the best of the best of what we have this year in yeah. our arts and this artist just politely walked out didn't make a scene or anything and and was actually being the artist is a, a Christian artist but was being um, lauded by a lot of non Christians saying. I totally agree, and you know I agree with your right to go and do that and do it politely because yeah, mm -hmm. somebody needs to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? What do you think their basis? I mean, when when they said this is not art or this is not great art, if you were to put the question to them, why not? I mean, there's instinct, there's intuition. Right, but could they explain why not? Yeah, I don't know if they could um, because I didn't I didn't see a lot of quotes about it. But um, you know, I know personally that you know usually draw uh, you know I draw the line uh, 
with I give people the right to have their opinion on on art, but I you know since I met Professor Carroll, you know I'm really just trying to <laughs> <laughs> do what you're uh, saying. She <laughs> is the standard. She's that standard. Say, She's what we've been looking for. Yes. Rather than Professor just Carroll. saying, well, that's just not right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, we have to be careful with Paul. We drag him around Europe. We have to, but no. But but isn't that still the whole thing? That's why we need to study philosophy, right? We need to read at least something to understand that this seemingly to our modern culture cold and obsolete idea of taste, standard mathematics, structure, the, yeah. the trivium, the quadrivium, the idea of education being a system that methodically and solidly and reliably educates the soul, the mind, the whole human being. You know, mm -hmm. we need mm -hmm. to get some of that um, yeah. if we're mm -hmm. going to go, you know, in any kind of direction. I mean, that isn't that kind of what you, when you when you have your 18-year-old freshman students in front of you, what do you tell them about why they need to do this? Yeah, um, well, remember there are many, many areas that phil philosophers don't limit themselves to anything. So we've been talking about aesthetics or or how, whatever you would want to call it, but you know there are the other questions like the immortality of the soul, the existence of God, uh, ethics. Those are the questions that the students that I encounter in class tend to be grappling with more than others. So you know, if I if I were to stand in front of them and say, you know what, uh, Miley Cyrus is probably not the best thing for your soul at this point, I think that would be several years worth of work, right? I, I'm serious. I think, I think that to have to bring them to the level where I would say, well, here, let's look at the math behind this. And it's not, it's not horrible. It's just so abysmally simple. And it's not simple, beautiful simple. It's simple, simple. Right? It, it's, um, it, it does nothing to strengthen the moral part of us. Uh, it's like oatmeal, right? Um, so I think I, I'm, I'm actually much more concerned with more fun on a day-to-day -day basis with more fundamental questions, not less important. I mean, not more important questions, but more fundamental ones. And then once we get those, if I can get them to see that, you know, the education of children entails forming their their character and their emotions, then the questions about music start coming up. They say, oh, if I have to form my children's emotions so that they feel the right way before they can really understand what's right and wrong, then what about music? And that, that's their question. What about art? What's, what's good? What's healthy? What's, what's uh, you know, why, porno why is pornography wrong? Right? They start seeing connections there. What's the difference between pornography and art? Then that's at that level those questions come up. But I agree with you. Absolutely that has to be done. Well, I always look at it this way is that you know, if, if art has to be provocative, well, if something has to provoke me for it to be good, then it's going to take something more to provoke me the next time. That's right. And, you know, and then the next time, and then the next time, and before you know it, it's just going to be complete chaos or yeah. just pain and death, and, you know, yes. yeah. uh, it's going to look like the poetry readings that I walked out of when I was in my 20s, and I said, wait a minute. What's going on here? This is yeah. there's too many yeah. one too many vampire poems right now. Oh yeah. Uh, let's let's get back to something that's fun. But um, you know, I so my my opinion, my humble opinion would be that it you know art should be more evocative than than provocative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I I certainly agree. Yeah. Well, and you've got it right. You know, as a teacher of college students. Um, and all of our um, circle of scholars and other people that are part of what we're doing here, uh, those of you who have the, the students headed to college or the middle schoolers, or we get to be older and look back on all this, I think we more and more see that uh, whatever our Latin teachers were trying to tell us in the seventh grade, or, <laughs> or our grandmothers, you know, it, it, we can find enormous enrichment and support if we can become a little more familiar with the basis of those, as you would say, we could almost say eternal values, yeah. um, shared right. by the Greeks, shared by the early Christians, brought down to us through all those medievalists, that these are not dull and um, oh, dull and old and dusty and useless. They are they are really like vitamins and minerals and roots that will nourish who we are and who we want to become. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Very good. That's absolutely right. Yeah. We really appreciate you taking time from fighting on the front lines. <laughs> I know you're very, very um, involved in all you're doing in your writing, your research, your daily teaching. We're very grateful. I know Paul and I are very happy about this. We hope we can maybe ask you again. I'm, I'm open to that. Sure. Yeah. If it uh, if it works. Yep. That Great. that sounds fine to me. Awesome. Well, thank Paul, you thank so much you. for joining us. Yeah, okay. uh, Professor Carol, do you have anything else? I uh, think we're just over the top. I hope that everybody's yeah. enjoyed this. I know a lot of people will be watching this subsequently, and uh, you can type in if you have questions. You can get send them to us, and we can send them on. And we look forward to next week when we move into the monastics. We move into the early uh, Christian centuries, but after the Edict of Milan, after Christianity is legal, and and you start seeing the growth of the systems that will soon be very recognizable to everyone. Uh, we've got and and getting into the point where soon we're going to have notated music and all kinds of things are about mm -hmm. to happen. So mm -hmm. we just uh, appreciate having you with us on the journey. And Professor Rue, thank thank you so much for being part of today. Uh, I was I, it was delightful. Thanks. Nice meeting you, Paul. Nice meeting you too. Thank you okay. so much, Professor Rue, and thank you everybody for joining us. Make sure you share this. It's going to be available on YouTube as soon as. This is over. It will be available as a link. You can post it on Facebook and everything. And we'll see you next week, everybody. So long. So long. Bye -bye.